Here you see a painting by Frederick Soriu in 1848. In fact, he prepared a series of four prints, visualizing his dream of world made of democratic and social republics. And this is the first print. You see, the peoples of Europe and America, men and women, all ages, all castes, are marching and offering homage to the Statue of Liberty as they pass by it. She bears the torch of enlightenment in one hand and the Charter of Rights in the other. On the ground lie the shatters remains of the symbols of absolutist institutions. What are absolutist institutions? Absolutist is a form of monarchical government which has absolute unlimited powers. The government is centralized, militarized, and repressive. You see their shattered remains, of crowns, armors, etc. The people are representing their nations, through their different flags, and national dresses. Leading the march, are the United States and Switzerland, who were already nation-states, at that time. A nation-state is formed, by a common culture. France, with the revolutionary tricolor, has just reached the statue. Behind her, is Germany. But at that time, Germany was not a nation-state. The flag, black, red, gold, is an expression of liberal hopes in 1848. From the heaven above, Christ, saints, and angels are looking at the scene. They symbolize friendship among the nations, which is called, fraternity. But Soryu's vision was utopian. Utopian means, a vision of society, that is very ideal, that it can't exist. You know, how his print depicts utopian idea. This chapter tells about such events, which visualized Frederick Soriu's idea. That is, rise of nationalism. So, the first clear-cut expression of nationalism came, with the French Revolution, in 1789. The political and constitutional changes, that came during the revolution, led to the transfer of powers from monarchy, to a body of French citizens. The revolution proclaimed, that it was the people who would constitute the nation, and shape its destiny. But how was sense of collective identity spread among the French people? The revolutionaries introduced certain measures, and practices. The ideas of La Patrie, and The ideas of La Patrie, and La Chitoyen emphasized the notion of a united community, enjoying equal rights under the constitution. A new French flag. The tricolor, replaced the royal standard flag. The Estates General, the Assembly, was now elected by active citizens, and was renamed as National Assembly. New hymns were composed, oaths taken, and martyrs commemorated. A central administrative system was put in place, which formulated uniform laws for all citizens. Custom duties and dues, within the territory, were abolished. A uniform system of weights and measures was adopted. Regional dialects were discouraged. And French? spoken in Paris, became the common language of the nation. Further, the revolutionaries declared, that it was the mission of France, to help other peoples of Europe to become nations. When the news of events of France reached different cities of Europe, educated middle classes began setting up Jacobin clubs. Their activities prepared the way for French armies, which moved into Holland, Belgium, Switzerland and Italy, in 1790s. The French armies began to carry the idea of nationalism abroad. You have surely heard about Napoleon. He was a military general of France. In the French Revolution. He played a great role. In 1804, he declared himself as the king of the nation. What? King? Did the monarchy return? Yes. The constitutional government again transformed into a monarchy. But Napoleon Bonaparte was accepted by the people, because of his role in French Revolution. The revolutionaries were happy too. In the same year, 1804, he introduced a civil code, which did away with all privileges, based on birth, established equality before the law, and secured the right to property. This was renamed as Napoleonic Code, in 1807. This code was exported to the regions under French control. In Dutch Republic, Switzerland, Italy, and Germany, he simplified administrative divisions, abolished feudal system, and freed peasants from serfdom and manorial dues. Feudal system was a system, in which landlords allowed peasants to use their land, as a change of service. 
the peasants who weren't allowed to travel freely. This misery of peasants was serfdom. In the towns too, guild restrictions were removed. Transport and communication systems were improved. All of this was appreciated by the peasants, artisans, workers, and new businessmen. And you know why? Uniform laws, standardized weights and measures, and a common national currency was introduced. This would facilitate the exchange of goods from one region to another. In the areas conquered by Napoleon, people's reactions were mixed. In places like Holland and Switzerland, in cities like Brussels, the French armies were, were welcomed as harbingers of liberty. But it soon turned into hatred, because it became clear that these type of administrative managements couldn't go hand in hand with political freedom. Napoleon increased the taxes and censorship. People were forced to join the French armies to conquer the rest of Europe. These repressive measures changed the people's thinking about France. At present, Europe is different nations. But in the 18th century, these nations were divided into kingdoms. The Eastern and Central Europe were under the control of different monarchies. The people were diverse. They didn't share a collective identity. They even spoke different languages. For example, the Ample, the Habsburg Empire ruled over Austria-Hungary. It included many different regions and peoples. It included the Alpine regions, that is, the Tyrol, Austria and Sundtenland, as well as Bohemia. The aristocracy was German-speaking. Aristocracy is the population which is dominant over the common people. You must recall the clergies and nobles of France. The Habsburg Empire also included the Italian-speaking provinces of Lombardy and Venetia and Hungary. Half population spoke Magyar, the other half spoke various dialects. In Galicia, the aristocracy spoke Polish. Besides these three dominant groups, in the Habsburg Empire, there also lived the massive peasants, which were Bohemians and Slovaks in north, Croats in south, and Romans in the east, and Transylvania. These diverse peoples couldn't promote a sense of unity. The only tie binding them was that a common emperor was ruling them. Let us see. How nationalism emerged in Europe, the aristocracy was the dominant class in Europe, socially and politically. Although they were scattered throughout the continent, they were united by a common way of life. They possessed estates in the countryside, while houses in towns. They all spoke French for diplomacy. They were connected to different aristocracies through marriage ties. This powerful aristocracy were a small part of the population. The majority in Europe was, you know, peasantry. In West, land was mostly farmed by tenants and small farmers. Whereas, in Eastern and Central Europe, landholding was characterized by vast estates, which were cultivated by serfs. Serfs were the peasants, you know, who worked for big landlords. The growth of industrial production and trade meant the growth of towns and emergence of commercial classes. Remember, that industrialization began in England in TJ 18th century, while in France and parts of German states. Industrialization came only in the 19th century. Due to industrialization, new social groups came into being. Can you guess those? Working class, middle classes made up of industrialists, businessmen, professionals. In East, these groups were, thus smaller in number. The idea of national unity gained popularity, in the educated, liberal middle classes. What's liberalism? It had different meanings in the 19th century Europe. Liberalism is derived from a Latin root, liber, meaning free. So, liberalism stood for freedom of individual, and equality before the law, for these middle classes. But equality before the law, was not necessarily, universal suffrage. Suffrage means, the right to vote. Although there was equality before the law in revolutionary France, but the first experiment of suffrage was given to men only. Not all men, but only property-owning men. Mms, the men without property, and all women were deprived of political rights. Although, for some period, 
all men got the right to vote. But the Napoleonic Code again, went back to limited suffrage for male. The women were reduced to minor. Thus, women were totally excluded from the right to vote. So, in 19th and the early 20th century, men without property, and all women, organized opposition movements, demanding equal rights. In the economic sphere, liberalism stood for freedom of markets, and abolition of state-imposed restrictions, on movement of goods. In the 19th century, it was a strong demand of middle classes. In the German-speaking regions, Napoleon's administrative measures had created a confederation of 39 states. Each state had its own currency, weights and measures. If a merchant, for example, is traveling from Hamburg to Nuremberg in 1833 to sell his goods, he had had to pass through 11 custom barriers and pay 5% custom duty each time. Duties were levied according to the weight or measurement of the goods. But, each state has its own system of weights and measures. This involved time-consuming calculations. For example, the measure of cloth was an L. But its length was different in each state. Such conditions were viewed as an obstacle to economic growth and exchange by the commercial classes. They argued for the creation of a unified economic territory which would allow free movement of goods and capitals. In 1834, a custom union was formed, named Zalverein. This initiative by Prussia was joined by most of the German states. This union abolished tariff barriers and reduced the number of currencies to just two, which were over 30 before. The creation of the railway network developed interests for national unification. Remember that in 1797, Napoleon invaded Italy. This was the beginning of Napoleonic Wars. In 1815, he was defeated, collectively by Britain, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. After the fall of Napoleon, all the European governments were driven by a spirit of conservatism. What is conservatism? As the name indicates, it is a political philosophy that stressed the importance of tradition, that established institutions and customs to preserve their tradition. The conservatives preferred slow development and not a quick change. The conservatives believed to preserve institutions like monarchy, church, property, family, etc. They strongly opposed the idea of democracy and nation states. They didn't propose to return to the society of pre-revolutionary days. Rather they realized that the changes made by Napoleon could strengthen monarchy. His changes could make the state power more effective and strong. Napoleon's administrative measures resulted in a modern army, bureaucracy, a dynamic economy, the abolition of feudalism. These conditions would be helpful to strengthen the monarchies of Europe. After the fall of Napoleon, Europe became unpeaceful. So, in the same year 1815, the European powers, Britain, Russia, Prussia, and Austria, met at Vienna to draw up settlement for Europe. The Vienna Congress was headed by an Austrian Chancellor, Duke Metternich. The members drew up the Treaty of Vienna of 1815 with the object of undoing most of the changes that came in Europe during Napoleonic Wars. The Bourbon dynasty, which was deposed during the French Revolution, was restored to power. France lost all its territory, conquered under Napoleon. A series of states were set up at the French boundaries to prevent its expansion in future. For this, the Kingdom of Netherlands, which included Belgium, was set up in north. In south, Genoa was added to Piedmont. Prussia was given some territories on its west, while Austria was given northern Italy. Do you remember the German Confederation of 39 states made by Napoleon? The Confederation was left untouched. In the east, Russia was given some part of Poland, while Prussia was given some part of Saxony. The main reason was to restore monarchies that were overthrown by Napoleon. Thus, these measures at Vienna Congress created a new conservative order. This, this conservative political system of 1815 was autocratic. They didn't tolerate any kind of criticism and restricted the activities that questioned the working of these governments. They imposed censorship laws to control everything in newspapers, books, plays, songs, that reflected the idea of liberty and freedom.
associated with the French Revolution. Even though, the memory of French Revolution, continued to inspire liberals. One issue taken by the liberals, was freedom of press. But these years of repression, after 1815, drove many liberals, underground. Means the liberal nationalists started forming secret societies, in many states of Europe, to train the revolutionaries, and spread their ideas. Because being a revolutionary at that time, meant to oppose monarchies, that were established after Vienna Congress. Most of the revolutionaries, thought that creation of nation states, was necessary for freedom. One such revolutionary was, Giuseppe Mazzini. He was an Italian revolutionary. He was born in 1807, in, Utel, where he was born. A hint. The city, which was a to Piedmont, in the Treaty of Vienna. Genoa. Genoa was a to Piedmont. He was born in Genoa, in 1807. He became a member of a secret society, of the Carbonari, at the age of 24, that is. In 1831, he attempted a revolution, in Liguria, and was sent to exile. In exile, he found two secret societies, Young Italy and Marseille, then, Young Europe and Bern. The members were young men, from Poland, France, Italy, and the German states. Mazzini believed, that God has intended nations, to be the natural units, of mankind. So Italy couldn't continue, to be a patchwork of small states and kingdoms. It must be forged, into a single unified nation. This unification alone, could be the basis of Italian liberty. Following his model, secret societies were built, in Germany, France, Switzerland, and Poland. Mazzini's opposition to monarchy, and his vision of democratic republics, frightened the conservatives. The Austrian Chancellor, Metternich, described him as the most dangerous enemy of our social order. 